Psalms 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Hmm. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? This must have been one of the affirming verses by which Martin Luther lived. He is described as a man who knew no fear, save for the fear of the Lord. It is a very good day to you, dear viewer. Welcome to the Great Controversy series. Today we are looking at chapter 8, Luther before the diet. And with me in studio, I have Sister Brenda Nube, I have Brother Tapello, I have Brother Brighton Nube, I have got Brother Francois Musafiri. My name is Modesta Muregu Masiwa. And before we get into today's proceedings, I'm going to ask Brother Brighton to take us to the Lord in prayer. Yeah. Let us pray. Our dear and kind Heavenly Father, thank you for granting us this opportunity to meet and discuss your word. May all proceedings bring glory and honor to your name. May we not be seen, but everything that be done show all glory and honor to your name. What else going to profit all is that to forgive us our sins. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. It was a time of great excitement in Germany. A new emperor had just ascended the throne and his name was Charles V. At this point in time, there was a deed that was taking place in a city called Worms. But in English, we would uh, actually pronounce it as the Diet of Worms. And we learned that at this diet, there were men of stature, heads of states, nobles, princes, and knights, and they had all come there to witness for the first time uh, who Charles V was. And so there was great excitement. So many issues of importance were going to be discussed at this deed of worms. Um, but we are told that even though there were civic duties, uh, civic issues to be discussed, political issues to be discussed, and all the other issues pertaining to state and religion, the most exciting thing that was engrossing the people was the cause or the deepest interest was in the cause of the Saxon reformer, Martin Luther. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very good chapter. It's a very intriguing chapter, especially with the play around of the diet of worms or the deed of worms. I, I think we should maybe try and define what the deed or slash the diet was. If you do a little research uh, into this matter, you will see that the Diet of Worms was a formal deliberative assembly. In other words, it was a parliament at the time, um, which, didn't ha which, which didn't take place too often. So you will find that if th there, are records, there are records of deeds that have occurred, and these deeds only happened when there were great issues to be deliberated over. Uh, you'll notice something very interesting. When I look at um, this whole assembly, this whole trial that Luther was going to go through, what does not interest me is not the trial itself, but what interests me is the build-up of events towards the trial of Luther. Mm. Now, um, Luther at that time is sickly. Yes. Uh, his health is not good and his friends fear for his life oh, yes. and they say to him you can't go in such a state and then Luther says uh, I will go to this state even if these people were to build a fire whose flames were so high mm. that they reach heaven yet I will go through them mm. even if I have to be carried on sticks I will not run away, I will go. Since my health is failing me, mm. I might not be able to walk in there, but I might be carried on sticks. You know, I was, I was particularly surprised with this kind of faith. Mm. Here is a man who says, I have seen God um, helping the three Hebrew boys, mm. not only helping them get out of the fire, going into the fire with them. Oh, yeah. So basically in his words, when he's saying, even if the flames reach to heaven, I'll go through them, you are saying, <laughs> the very same Jesus who went with the three Hebrew mm. boys mm. will go, go through the flames with me. Mm. It, it's very interesting to see that God can manifest himself in so many ways. You know, once we begin a journey with God, uh, there's one thing that I always learned from my personal experience is that doubt must not be in you. Yeah. And you can see Luther at this point has not yet doubted God. 
And he's seeing in God the person who can come through for him at each, at, at each and every given stage of his life. Now, in the previous lessons, we actually learned about Luther standing against the entire world. So one man in God able to stand against the, the superpowers of the world. But now he has to go and appear and stand before these individuals because they are going to, uh, they're going to decide on his fate. So as you look at Martin Luther at this chapter, we're going to, to go again to deliberate, deliberate and be able to see exactly the details on how God is going to manifest himself. It's still an individual who sees deliverance. If it takes place, you know, many of us, we always want to be taken away from the circumstances. Sometimes our deliverance can find us within the circumstances. So Daniel and his friends, they actually delivered inside. They never, God never actually prevented them from going into the fire. But in the fire, God was with them. So Luther is now standing and saying, it doesn't matter whether my health is good or bad. Standing there, that's where I'm going to stand. Oh, no. So that if God comes through, it's still fine. But if I'm going to die, it's still okay. So this, this is the mindset that we need to cultivate as a people while we are working with God. So we, we must always expect two things. Either to remain in there or to be taken out of there. And God will actually manifest one of the two things. It's either going to come through for you and take you out of the situation or it's going to allow you to go through the situation, not for yourself, but for the salvation of many others. Because God always has a bigger plan, a bigger picture, a bigger spectrum, you know, a bigger work that I want to accomplish to each and every one of us. So... For me, the character of Luther at this uh, particular, you know, situation, it's a very beautiful picture to see because he's looking at God as a God who does not forsake, neither abandon his own. Martin Luther comes across as a man of courage, a man who was very brave, a man who was steadfast, a man who would not go back on what he had devoted himself to. And when we look at Christianity itself, the issues of faith, mm. we cannot... Be into it half-heartedly. Oh, yes. We have to be into it a hundred percent. We have to give all of ourselves. Mm. Um, the singer sings and he says, I surrender all. Oh, yes. And you know, I've always asked myself, how do you surrender all? Mm. But when I was reading the story of Martin Luther, I realized that he is a man who had surrendered all. <laughs> there is also a verse that has always intrigued me. Matthew chapter 10, mm. verse 39. And Jesus says, he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake mm -hmm. shall find it. And therefore, Luther had come to this place where he was willing to lose his life mm. so that he could eventually find it. Actually, you know that's where the beauty of the whole story is. He knows that his life is in danger, but he has to go and proclaim the word of God. Mm. And he says, if they desire to use violence against me, and that is very probable, for it is not for their instruction that they order, they order me to appear. Mm. So he says, I place the matter in the Lord's hands. Mm. He still lives and reigns who persevered the three young men in the burning fiery furnace. Mm. And this is where the, the, the interesting part comes. He says, if he will not save me, my life is of little consequence. Mm. Actually, if you look at Daniel 3 verses 16, the Hebrew boys say the same thing to the king. They say, oh king, we will not bow down to this stage, oh, yeah. for we serve a living God, and he will be able to save us from the burning furnace. But if he does not, let it be known unto you mm. that he still lives. And maybe it's a lesson to be learned quickly as Christians that we serve God not because he is able to save us, oh, yes. but we serve God because he is God. Mm. And so we come to situations in life whereby we say, even if he does not take me out of the situation, mm. he is still God. And I think that's something interesting and there's something beautiful when we look at the matters on how they viewed God. Mm. Mm. You know, when, when, when you come down to business as a Christian, there's one thing that there is one of the biggest principles that we need to always to understand. And I think Martin Luther actually understood it very well and was applying it in his personal life. And that is when you join Christ, you must be able to count the cost and be willing to pay the price. Once if you have that mindset, then the rest will fall in place. Because many of us are going to turn away and reject Christ and be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, simply because when we begin with Christ or in a, along the way as we walk in with Christ, we have not yet counted the cost. It's very impossible when you have counted the cost and you know how much it will cost you. If you are in for, for death, then you don't expect anything. 
because it's, it's of great pleasure when one dies for the master because he first died for us. So a Christianity is not a, a, you know, a, a marching order where you're going to go and do your wedding day. No, it is, a way, it, it is a way that we need to carry our cross in the process, but that cross, it's either gonna lead us to be crucified as Christ did, or it's gonna lead us to be also laid down our lives as Christ did. So Martin Luther, when I'm looking at this chapter here, he has made up his mind already. And we have, we have learned about this one man, who have actually walked with God and he has feel, I mean, he actually experienced the power of God in his personal life. So that was also one of the uh, oomph that I came in to be able to say that I'm going to go through it no matter what it takes. I want us also to look at the fact that Martin Luther is condemned before he is tried. <laughs> Just like it happened with Jesus and yeah. it happened with his disciples. Correct. <clears throat> now, there is a particular character that is interesting here. Mm. His name is Aliander. Now, this man is a man of influence, oh, yeah. very educated. Mm -hmm. Now he goes out of his way to try and convince people mm. that Martin Luther is wrong. He has done one, two, three, four, five. He goes to his followers, he mm. goes to crowds, princes, men of authority then, mm. to try and prove that Martin Luther is wrong to an extent of going to Rome, mm. to say, stand with me, see what Martin Luther has done. Now, when this man is busy doing all of this, mm. The man of God was wrestling with God in prayer. Mm. He is asking that the Lord may lead the whole trial. Mm. And he is pleading with the Lord to be merciful to him and not leave him alone. Not that he desired his life, but that he desired the will of the Lord to be done. To be done. Because when his followers were telling him, Martin Luther, you can't go. Mm. He says, remain praying. When you pray, don't pray for me. Pray for the word of the Lord, mm. for I am not important, yeah. but his word is. Mm. Now, when this guy went out of his, his way to do all of this caucusing mm. that he was doing, mm. the writer of this book said, if only he had realized how much energy he had put in doing that which was wrong, mm. he would have used this energy for the cause of God and the Lord would have been accomplished, which becomes an object lesson to us. Mm. What are we exerting our energies to? Yeah. Is that bringing any good effect to the cause of God? Mm. If it is not, like Martin Luther said, we must turn away from our evil ways mm. and do that which benefits the kingdom. So this Eliendo was a very colorful character. Um, he actually succeeds in um, persuading the emperor from stopping Martin Luther from coming to represent himself before the deed of Worms. And the reason why he did this is because he was afraid that should Martin Luther come and present himself before this assembly, he's mm. going to persuade everyone uh, to his cause. You know, Ellen White writes and she says that light and darkness cannot harmonize. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. When you look at the energy that Eliana put into this whole mm. thing, you will mm. be surprised because Martin Luther, how was Martin Luther such a threat? Martin Luther was just a poor reformer. Mm. <laughs> he and the other dignitaries were men of rank, oh, important yes. men mm. who had everything at their disposal. But this Eliander is really, is really um, intimidated mm. by Martin Luther. Oh, yeah. So you will see that bad is intimidated by good. Mm. Darkness is intimidated by light. And therefore, as we walk in the light, we should not be afraid of the darkness. Mm -hmm. It is actually intimidated mm -hmm. by us. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we must take into consideration is that when Martin Luther is preparing to go for the trial, he has to pass through certain cities. Now, for the fear of being associated with Martin Luther, mm. there were some cities where he was not welcome. Mm. And in some cities, he was welcomed with triumph. Yeah. And people gathered with him so that together they can discuss the word of the Lord. Thank you very much. At this moment in time, we're going to take a break. And after the break, we're going to continue with the Martin Luther story. Welcome back. Before the break, we were discussing Martin Luther at the deed 
of worms. And we realized that there was so much excitement and so much going on at this state of worms. At this point in time, we are going to go more into detail uh, about what happened at the deed of worms. Before we went for break, there are some cities that welcomed Martin Luther. There are some that they didn't. I'm particularly intrigued by the address he made in one of the cities. He says when he gets there, he's addressing a whole crowd. He says to them, you have been told before that life comes from men. Mm. But I am here to tell you to, today where eternal life comes from. Mm. There is only one man who was born who died for sinners, yeah. who possesses eternal life, which is Jesus Christ, and he gives it to people for free. Now, automatically, when he's saying that, he's also throwing away what the monks and the priests were telling the people uh, about about a, a crest for sale, you yeah. know? You bring so much money, your sins are pardoned, and mm -hmm. all of that. Now, Martin Luther qualifies to say, there is only one man who can pardon sins, who can give life eternal, mm -hmm. and that is Jesus Christ. If we actually look at it, this is a, a, a place where the Church of God is persecuted mm. by the Roman Empire and by the emperors and by everyone else in authority really because they want to subdue this gospel that everyone has. Mm. And when someone else who is not Martin Luther, by the way, speaks against the, the, the Roman Empire, he says these, he, he is speaking against the leaders, mind you, he says these are some of the abuses that cry out against Rome. Mm. All shame has been put aside and their only object is money, money, money. Mm. So that the preachers who should teach the truth utter nothing but falsehoods mm. and are not only tolerated but rewarded because the greater their lies, the greater their gain. And when Isaiah explains it in Isaiah 56 verse 11, he says they are dogs with mighty appetites. Mm. They never have enough. Yep. They are like shepherds who lack understanding. Mm. They all turn to their own way. They seek their own gain. Such was the Roman Empire. They wanted to mix politics with the religion. Hence, 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 hence what uh, the facilitator said earlier. You, it, 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 uh, light has no relationship with darkness. Mm. They were so constantly trying to mingle the two. And when they were mingling the two, they came up on top and they were the only and the sole beneficiaries of that system. So this is the kind of system that Martin Luther and all the reformers want to speak against. This is the kind of light that they are trying to bring to, 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 to everyone. That's very true. I mean, that, that, that's very powerful because church and state actually came together. And this has been uh, the agenda of the, the papacy or the Catholic Church from, from its very inception, where they always strive to want to bring church and state together so that when the church and state come together, they're always being the one leading out. And when they lead out, what follows is persecution, opposition to the gospel of Christ. They have never done anything good. And, and when you come back here, you know, just to connect to what my brother was saying, that the work of a Reformation was not ended with Luther. Unless we come to a space saying that maybe it is done, because recently there was there was a uh, there was an agreement which was signed uh, between the, the papacy, the Catholic Church in our time, and uh, the rest of the Protestant churches, saying that the Reformation is over. It only, it only exists in the time of Luther. And this thing has been going on. And as we are speaking right now, there is a summit that is taking place whereby they are now, mm. they are now trying to bring all the church leadership together under one head. And, and, and the government also is trying to interfere with that as well, to be part of that. So you can see church and state is now being promoted in our time. But I want to read for you a paragraph which speaks about this, that the Reformation never ended with Martin Luther. So God is expecting reformers in the last days. Okay, so it says that the Reformation did not, as many suppose, as many suppose, end with Luther. It is to be continued to the close of this world's history. Luther had a great work to do in reflecting to others the light which God had permitted to shine upon him. Yet he did not uh, receive all the light which was to be given uh, to the world. From that time to this, from that time to this, new light has been continually shining upon the scriptures and new truths have been constantly unfolding. So Luther has that present truth of his. It was all about to make sure that people are aware of what is going on. And we are told that God is going to unfold more light. Why? Because darkness is going to increase as well. 
They are going to be this union of church and state together. And God is expecting individuals, men and women, who are going to study scriptures. And through the study of scriptures, they'll be able to understand the scriptures. And God is going to call them to stand like Luther's. In their weaknesses, they are going to find strength, not in themselves, but in God. Just as Luther was willing to stand in front of this fry, I mean, in front of these leaders and want to advocate for the truth and nothing else. So we have to sit down and be able to look at ourselves. Since the world is now calling us to set up a Protestant movement or the reformers, it ended. Are we still going to stand in? Mm -hmm. when, we, when we compare our character with the character of Luther, are we matching somewhere? Are we getting somewhere? How many times are we studying our Bibles? Because it was the Bible and the Bible alone that Luther was actually preaching. And as he was preaching the Bible, he could only discover one person, and that's Christ. Mm. And he could only present to the world nothing else but Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. And he could only live for nothing else but Christ. So you can see, when you study scripture, you have nothing else to live for but Christ himself. Mm. So God is looking for down to the end of the history, I mean to the world history, to see Luther's. Mm. who are going to have the same characteristics as Luther's and they're going to advocate for nothing else but the truth and the truth alone. Because he said in one of his episodes, I know I still remember it always being there, where, where Luther said, it is a sin for one to speak against his conscience. Of course. When our consciences are actually seared by the word of God, mm -hmm. we'll have nothing else to defend but the truth and the truth alone. So Luther lived a life whereby he forgot about himself and he could only live for Christ. Mm. And God is looking forward to such a group. Mm. It reminds me of Matthew chapter 22, verse 21. Mm. Jesus, Jesus says, uh, as he's been tested uh, about whether or not it is correct to, to, to pay taxes. Oh, yes. During that test, he says that you should render unto Caesar what, belongs. Is, what belongs to Caesar, and you should render unto God what belongs to God. Mm. And it's a characteristic that Martin Luther has in that he says that he is willing, he is willing, during the deed, he says that he is willing to follow the laws of the land. Oh, he is willing to give everyone the respect and honor that is due to them. Mm -hmm. but, he, but the line is when it comes to scripture. Yeah. He will not compromise scripture in order to follow uh, the rules that are set by, 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 by the papacy. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So we realize that initially, Martin Luther never get, gets a chance to speak before they did. Mm. But God moves upon a man. And surprisingly, this man is actually an enemy of the reform. <laughs> he is called George of Saxony. Mm. He says, uh, after the address of Leander, he speaks about the crimes of papas. Mm. He says, in as much as this man has spoken of the goodness of the Pope and Catholicism and everything, mm. the papacy has actually committed crimes against the Germany people. Oh, yes. He speaks um, about the lives that have been lost mm. in the name of the papacy, the extortions, the falsehoods, and all the other things that had been a, a, a thorn in the flesh of the Germany people. Mm. And when he does this, he makes an impression upon the diet. And eventually, um, the committee demands that Martin Luther appears oh, yes. before the committee. I just had to mention that, to say that God works in wonderful ways. Mm. Sometimes he moves even his enemies to speak for his cause. It mm. reminds me of Balaam. Yeah. He went out to curse the children of Israel, but he ended up blessing, blessing them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And therefore, I'll read um, from this chapter, and it says, um, had the eyes of the assembly been opened, they would have seen the angels of God in their midst, mm -hmm. shedding beams of light athwart the darkness of error and opening minds and hearts to the reception of truth. Mm. And therefore, as the children of God, we should not be scared to stand for the light. We can stand for the light just like Martin Luther did. And God will always be mm. with us. You, you know where the beauty of this whole situation is when he starts to speak? Mm. When he is finally given the chance to speak, instead of him promoting self, he promotes Christ. Oh, yeah. mm. These are his opening remarks. He says, philosophers, doctors, and writers, mm. he says, have endeavored to teach men the way to obtain everlasting life. Yeah. And they have not succeeded, my mm. you. He says, I will now tell it to you. God has raised one man from the dead, mm. the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might destroy death, 
extirpate sin mm. and shut the gates of hell. Mm. When he is finally, I, I, I want to assume the man was boiling. <laughs> he, he wanted to say something and they finally give him the stage. Mm. And what, what, what does he say when he gets the stage? Look up to Jesus. And when Jesus explains it to Nicodemus, he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent to the children of Israel, mm. so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Mm. I think this is a cause for concern if we have speakers who stand up and promote self. Mm. It's a cause for mm. concern if we have speakers who stand up and promote wealth, speakers who stand up and promote success, mm. we are told of speakers and reformers and martyrs who when they stood up, they only lifted up one name, mm. the name of Christ. But unfortunately, we are living in an era whereby people stand up and promote wealth. Mm. And unfortunately, they are gathering so many crowds because they tell the people what the people want to hear. Mm. But we are called, as my brother said, to be reformers in the last days. Mm. Reformers who will stand up and just as Moses lifted up the serpent and the children of Israel were healed, mm. so must the Son of Man be lifted up in these last days mm. and the nation will be healed. In oh yeah. Mm. You, you see, that, that's, that's the secret of the gospel. The gospel is locked in one thing that's Christ. You see, so when, when I look at Martin Luther standing up, he could only speak about Christ. We have to look at also because there are individuals somewhere there. I don't know where they are watching this one from. Mm -hmm. You know, someone might be asking, how do I know that these people are the people of God? A people of God can be known distinctively from the rest of the world. When Martin Luther stood up and spoke out, everyone was able to see that this man, this messenger is different from the rest. So we, we've got so many churches, so many denominations and religion around the world. If you are looking for a place where you can find the gospel of Christ, just examine what we're actually sharing here. When someone stands up, what is their agenda? Because we can only know that you are sent by God when you are addressing two things, lifting up Christ and condemning sin of which we don't see it currently in our churches. We speak more of prosperity, we speak more of money, and money, as my brother read from that quotation, their, their obsession was just money, 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 money. And you can see that the imprint of the papacy is actually in the hands of the churches that are living today, really? where they address, where they, the whole energy is put on how they can make money. Okay, I want us to look at something very inter interesting. When Martin Luther, he has finally been summoned. Mm. They say everybody went out and gathered. There was no room to an extent that you would almost be stepping on top of people to go oh, in yeah. there. Now, something very interesting, when he was close to the door, an old general, so, so they referred to him, went to him and said, Oh monk, oh monk, I might not quote his actual words, yeah. but basically what this old man was saying to Martin Luther is, you are here on a good cause. Mm. Do not be afraid. Oh, yes. Your God will not leave you alone. He will go with you. <laughs> now, Martin Luther is positioned in a chair that mm. is in front of the um, empire. Of the empire. Uh, Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. He's positioned in front of the empire mm. as if to intimidate him. Now, Martin Luther would not be intimidated by earthly power because he had known him who is God Almighty. Oh, yes. Now, when he gets there, the empire only asks him, Two questions. Actually, before he asks him, they look at him, his noble, simple appearance. Yeah. And it almost looks like Martin Luther is defeated. He's going to change his weight. Another man comes to him and whispers mm. that he should not be afraid. The Lord will not leave him. And then after that, the empire says to Martin Luther, I will ask you only two questions. Mm. Are these your writings, carrying Martin <laughs> Luther's writings? The empire keeps quiet. Yeah. And the second question was, um, are you going to retract what you wrote here mm. or you will not? And Martin Luther says, I'm going to answer the first question. Mm. The, writing, truly, the writings truly are mine. mine yeah. And he says for the second question, yeah. I will not answer <laughs> because it is, it is speaking to my, question, to my conscience. Mm. It is matters of faith. Oh, yes. I will need time mm. to gather myself mm. and then come and give an answer. Mm. When we come from the break, we are going to see how Martin Luther further responds to the questions that he had been asked. Join us after the break. Reading from the Great Controversy, it says here, 
Never had a man appeared in the presence of a more imposing assembly than that before which Martin Luther was to answer for his faith. So before the break, we realized that he was asked two questions and he had to respond. Now we want to delve more into his responses. Okay, just to provide some context, the, the papacy was a supreme power. They had supreme authority during this time. And when the, the, the Pope had uh, excommunicated Martin Luther, and his invitation to this date was already a loosening of their power. Hmm. And because the papacy held power and influence over spiritual truth, they, they were going to go to great lengths uh, to, to make sure that Luther recants what, what he had uh, written before. So when he, had asked the, when he was asked the question of whether the writings were his, he said, indeed, these writings my mind. When we are presented with an opportunity to minister to a soul, mm. we do not, we do not uh, exude the, the character of Christ, but rather we are prideful, we are scornful, we are angry. Mm. And, and this turns away people from, from, from God. So I like that Martin Luther uh, did not rush into, into explaining his case. He did not rush into answering the second question, but rather was prayerful about it. Mm. And that is a, uh, something, that we should, uh, something that we should learn from him. Oh, yes. When he came the next day, instead of him again promoting himself, mm. he promotes Christ. He says, I don't want to talk lest while I talk, I promote myself. He says, I don't want to say things, lest the things I say end up overshadowing the gospel. Mm. So for that reason, allow me to retreat and go home, and I will come back and, and, and answer to this question. And when he comes back to answer to the question, he, he, he does not retract, number one. He does not retract. Actually, he continues spreading the word. He delves deep into the gospel so much that the emperor gets, gets uh, angry and he says to him, Luther, are you or are you not mm. going to take back your writings? Yeah. And Luther says, in case in my rush answering again, I end up offending the gospel. Allow me to tell you about Christ. And then he explains to them the gospel. Yeah. And after he explained the gospel to them, he says, I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils, mm. because it is clear as the day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Mm -hmm. As Tabelo said, these were parties that were in power. Yep. And he says, I am promoting the gospel today because the parties that are in power themselves have erred from the gospel. Mm. And after they have, not only have they erred from the gospel, but they speak against each other. Mm. They contradict each other. And then he says, I will present to you the basis of all guidance, the basis of all correction and the basis of all truth. So he says, unless therefore I am convinced by the testimony of scripture yeah. Yeah. or by the clearest reasoning mm. that these writings of mine are wrong. Mm. If you can convince me, Bible-based, that what I have wrote is wrong, I will be the first myself to take these, my writings, and yeah. toss them into the fire. Yeah. And so uh, when Isaiah explains it, he says, to the law and to the testimony, mm -hmm. if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no it light in them. them. Mm. So what Martin Luther is simply saying is, there is no light in the people that are leading us. Hence, I am promoting to you today the word of God. Mm. And if they want to hold me guilty today before the court, let them use the Bible. Bible as the standard mm. of, 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 of the law. Mm. And if they find me guilty based on what the scriptures say, mm. I myself will take my recordings and I will toss them into the fire. Mm. And I think it's something that we need to realize as Christians today. Yeah. We have no other source, my oh, brother. Yeah. Yeah. We have no other source of guidance, no other source of correction, mm. no other mm. source of rebuke other than the Bible. You see, we live in an era whereby people want to put laws for themselves that will actually go in, in, in line with their lifestyles. They want to contradict the Bible so that they themselves can find their, their, their themselves righteous in front of the people. So this was the kind of, of, 
of movement mm. that Martin Luther was fighting against. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. You see, <laughs> when yeah. the Bible has become you and you have become the Bible, it, it's beautiful because you can stand between, I mean, you can stand in front of anyone. Mm. and be able to defend what you know. Mm. Because there are many of us who are building up our spiritual life in, you know, in, in the words of men. And that's, that's just a sinking sand. Sinking sand. Mm. So Martin Luther knew how to build his character upon the word of the Lord. But I just want to bring this all as, you know, aspect of Martin Luther, the emotions that I actually portray when we was standing between these guys. You know, we thought that he was just tranquil. He was, yes, but he was, he was way early, he was standing you know, be, be in front of these guys uh, when they're about to pass their judgment and so on and so forth, challenging him to be able to say something and recant. Have you ever realized that Rome is known by uh, a method of always leading, leading its opponent to recant? Yes. Mm. yes. Time and again, I mean, John, I mean, John, you know, you can, Jerome, Jerome and the rest of the guys, yes. they will always, yeah, they always ask them to recant. You know, because they know that if you can recant, then you are saying that what I said, it was not true. But if the truth has been truth, you won't find a room to be able to, you know, to backtrack. Now, let me just read for you this paragraph. He says, for a time, his heart sank within him as, as he contemplated the forces that were co combined against the truth. His faith faltered. I mean, fear, fear, fearful, I mean, fearfulness and trembling, I mean, trembling came upon him and horror overwhelmed him. So this is what he was going through while standing there. But when you come down, because he knew scripture and he says this in his, in his prayer to God, silent, he says, O almighty and everlasting God, he pleaded, how terrible is this world? Behold, it openeth its mouth to swallow me up and I have so little trust in thee. Okay, then it says, if it is only in the strength of this world that I must put my trust, all is over. So he, he, he has never trusted that there will be any other source of power which will come in. And then he will begin to speak saying that the only person that I can actually trade against my enemy is God himself. So Psalms, I mean, Psalm 60 verse 11 and 12 was always in the head of, 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 uh, of Martin Luther. It says, look, violently we can do, but it has to be done with, through God and our enemies are going to be trade. So when he stood in the midst of the council, he saw nothing else that is going to, you know, it's going to allow him to be able to, because if he would have backtracked from his own writings, guess what? It was going to affect everyone that he has <laughs> ever preached to. True. So the devil wanted to use this as an opportunity to try and undermine the work that God has already built. Mm -hmm. So in whatever that we do, we must always remember that the devil will always want to seek an opportunity. Mm. on how he can bring to nothingness that which we have already built. But if we have stood with God, when we stand before him after we've stood with God, it's much easier for us to be able to make it through and we continue to advocate for the truth because we cannot be ashamed of what we have actually believed. Mm. Now, when Martin Luther is standing in front of the emperor, he says, when he's given a chance to defend himself, mm. he says, I shall therefore defend myself as Christ did. If I have spoken evil, Bear witness of the evil. Oh, yes. Now, we, here is a man who says, I am coming to defend myself like Christ did. Then mm. my mind was drawn back to the sins of Christ's crucifixion. Mm. He was moved from one place to another. Oh, People yes. trying to find guilt. Fault. Fault. Mm. Thank you, my brother. They could not find any fault with mm. Christ. Same applies to Martin Luther. He says, if I have done anything wrong, point it out. They couldn't. Everything that he talked about, his basis of argument, oh, yes. were all biblically based. Now, what Martin Luther was trying to fight here was custom and tradition. Mm. Now, the word of God was polluted by custom and tradition, which is what Christ was fighting during his time, which is what the disciples were fighting during their time. Okay. Mm. When Martin Luther is in front of the assembly, not only did he speak, he preached. Mm. There should have been an altar call there. Yeah. <laughs> there were supposed to be people who were going to be converted. Mm. I mean, the emperor should have, have, have repeated the words of Felix when Paul stood before him mm. and said, Paul, you almost made me a Christian. Yeah. That's what Martin Luther was doing at that time. And sure. then the Bible says, if light has come your way mm. and you have rejected it, mm. it shall st stand as testimony before you in the judgment day. Oh, yeah. When these men are giving podiums, 
that are supposed to work to their disadvantage. Mm. They make them work for the advantage of the cause of God. They preach mm. and converts are supposed to be gained from those assemblies. Oh, yeah. And the moment they take them to trial, heaven records, and that shall stand before them as testimony before the judgment day that he spoke, mm. light was shared to you, mm. and you did not listen. Same applies to us. Mm. As light is continuously shared to us, oh, yes. and we deliberately choose not to listen, it shall stand before us as testimony. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the book of Luke chapter 21, verse 15, the Bible speaks about when we are going to stand before kings, if we have been walking with God, you know, I, I love. The, let me just share with you guys in uh, Luke chapter twenty-one, verse fifteen. It says, "For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gain, say, nor resist." So, if we have been walking with God all along, and we have known how to kneel before God so that we can stand before kings. When we come before the kings, no matter how intellectual they can be, they can come and try and gain say whatever, but God says, I'm going to give you a mouth to speak and wisdom. So Martin Luther in front of these individuals, God has to intervene and come in and be able to speak through him. So God will always stand on the side of his children, no matter what the circumstances may be. We learn that Charles V rejects the testimony of Martin Luther, and he actually condemns him. But um, Martin Luther is protected from his enemies mm. because of the support of his friends. God will always raise people that will support us as we worship him and as we stand yeah. on his side. At this moment in time, I'm going to give my panelists the chance to say their closing remarks. Mm. Luther's writings uh, have now been rebuked by the emperor. He is hidden by Frederick of Saxony, I believe. Mm -hmm. And when he is hidden, he continues writing. In isolation, he continues writing, continues his work, and translates the New Testament from Latin to German. Mm -hmm. So he continues his work. But another thing you may notice is, just like in John chapter 3, verse 30, uh, Luther was in this case decreased so mm -hmm. that the word of God might be increased. Oh, yeah. He was taken away from the spotlight so that the word of the Lord might be the one that moves forward mm -hmm. and, not, and not Martin Luther himself. When the chapter itself concludes, it reads, but when eternal interests are concerned, God wills not that men should submit to men. Mm -hmm. For such submission in spiritual matters is a real worship mm -hmm. and ought to be rendered solely to the Creator. But the devil seeks to divert men's thoughts and affections from God and fix them upon human agencies. He leads them to honor mere instruments and ignore the hand that directs the events of all providence. Mm. And so when uh, they explain it in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Acts chapter 4 verse 12 reads, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Mm. This is a call maybe to all our viewers at home. There is no other name we are given under which we can be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. This was why we had reformers and martyrs during the times of Martin Luther and the times of John Haas. People who devoted their lives so that they could change the direction from the worship of, of popes, from the wo worship of the Roman emperors, from the worship of all these important people and direct our worship to Jesus Christ. Mm. For there is no other name. I think we can conclude it, my brother. Oh, yeah. And say there is no other name. Mm -hmm. We are given mm -hmm. under heaven mm -hmm. that we might be saved oh, yeah. other than the, the name, name of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Yes. And if they do not preach Yes. The name of Jesus Christ, it is because there is no light in him. Mm. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Today, may you be inspired by the spirit of courage, the spirit, the Holy Spirit. And may you be filled with that love, that perfect love that casts out of fear. As we conclude, I'm going to ask my brother to pray for us. Our oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for the day that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for affording, for affording us the opportunity to come and read your word, Lord. At this moment, we ask that the Holy Spirit continues to guide and protect us as we go on through our lives. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.